Hello everyone, welcome to week two, module three. Uh, this is our second content-based lecture. We're dealing with first generation feminist arts in the United States in this, or early feminist arts, things that were produced in the 60s and through the 1970s by a group of feminist artists um, who specifically tailored their art to changing things in the world around them to help uh, build a sense of woman that they believed patriarch patriarchal society had neglected. Remember, we started off here uh, last week looking at the way that in this bipolar field of representation, uh, women were oftentimes traditionally ascribed these types of characteristics that you see on the right-hand column. Women were, in general, aligned with the body and with nature, and some of the qualities that we see ascribed to them are that they are passive, emotional, natural, built for the home or the do domestic interior. They are mothers or nurturers, docile, chaste, and a huge component of the value ascribed to them is based upon their appearance. What we said last time, and what I want to reiterate here, is that in the process of building a sense of identity or individuality for the masculine, women becomes other to the men. Now, in various contexts, those attributes ascribed to women that we see here on the screen uh, are very highly valued. But in general, we can say that the privileged characteristics are those ascribed to men. Women become uh, a second sex, as Simone de Beauvoir famously said uh, in her 1940s and 50s text, The Second Sex. So I wanted to take us through, before we get into these feminist artists of the early 60s and through the 70s, um, some other examples of work by women artists in the 19th and early 20th century so as to set up what is different about the, the basic idea of what a woman artist does versus what a feminist artist does or how they conceive of their studio practices and the production of their art. So what you're looking at here on the screen, and if you haven't yet done this, certainly download the lecture guide for this lecture. It has all the artist names, and when we get to the major artists, the names of their works of art, the dates of those works of art, and the key terms that I'll be using in this lecture. After the lecture, you can also look at the PDF files of the images that were used in this lecture and use those to jot notes down on in preparation uh, for your quizzes that, again, don't come around until the sixth week of this quarter. So, as was famously noted by the art historian Linda Nochlin in the 1970s, women artists were never really given a fair shake historically. The material conditions for art production, the practices that were put in place, the various societal assumptions about what a woman was made it very difficult for women artists to attain the same stature as their male contemporaries. Most of the art that I showed you last class period had to was looking at works of art produced by male artists um, that in one way or another were representations of the key assumptions about women uh, that were inherent in the culture of their time. And so um, what we were saying is that there was this belief that men and women were essentially different, that they occupied different spheres, they had different strengths and characteristics, and that the, the types of representations that we saw were really meant to be uh, representations of the ideal characteristics of the female sex. When we talk about women artists, uh, and we, we just think this way about art at this stage, that art is a representation that either overtly or implicitly represents the key belief, beliefs or ideological assumptions of a time period, we can say that of female artists, more often than not, all the way into the 19th century, the types of works that they represented and the way they represented their subjects partook of the beliefs of the patriarchal society in which they found themselves. They are, because they are products of this society, uh, subject to the same sets of beliefs and assumptions about gender as their male contemporaries. And of course, they were expected by their patrons to produce works of art that were in line with those sets of assumptions. 
Now, there are also some material conditions for women's art that made it difficult for a woman to achieve the same status as men. One of the big ones is that it was difficult and frankly, fairly unsafe for women to enter the studio of a master artist to learn how to become an artist, which was the main way that art was taught all the way up until uh, you know, the rise of the academy system in France in 1650s or so when this was all streamlined and artists went to the academy and master artists to learn from them. Another way to put this is, uh, in a famous example, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, like most artists, female artists, was the daughter of a master male artist. Her work reflects some of those gendered assumptions of the time period, but even more importantly, what I want to call attention to is that when it came to teaching women art, not only was the male artist studio a dangerous place to be, even in her father's studio, Artemisia Gentileschi was rather infamously sexually assaulted. It's just one of the difficulties that faced them. It was also the case that one of the key things that every artist, every classical artist anyway, who wanted to attain any stature had to develop a skill for was represent, representing the male body or even the female body, the nude. And these were, uh, this put women into a difficult place because it was assumed that women shouldn't be uh, subject to male nudes, uh, shouldn't study from the male nude because it was against their chaste nature, that it wasn't socially appropriate for a woman to study from a nude live model in the same way that it was for men. And so think of an entire practice that is built around, as Linda Nochlin pointed out, learning anatomy and learning in particular the male anatomy and having your teacher say that you couldn't study from the male nude. That's just one example of how these things are difficult for women. In the 19th century, many of these things open up. The academic system uh, in France is breaking down a bit. Uh, we have the rise of alternative venues for the exhibition of art, as well as alternative venues for uh, learning the arts. And so, for instance, with this artist that you see on the screen, this is Mary Cassatt's work of a mother and child. These women didn't have to worry about their safety. They didn't have to worry about necessarily studying from the male nude because their subjects didn't necessitate that kind of understanding. This allowed them to produce art uh, in much the same manner as their male contemporaries and be valued for their productions, at least in as much as Impressionist artists were of value during their day. It also led uh, to the representation of subjects in particular ways that seemed to um, really draw upon the woman painter's experience. If you look back, for instance, at last lecture, the first image I showed of Raphael's Madonna and Child, the uh, Madonna of the Goldfinch, what people oftentimes point out is that these male artists, and it's part of the style as well, of course, seem to have very little understanding of the intimate relation between a mother and child. They also don't have a particularly good understanding of children's anatomies, which is why those children all look like little adults, uh, at least in part. So when we see these works, such as this one, you get that sense of intimacy. You certainly get a representation of the female experience. Mary Cassatt would have seen mothers and children all around her all the time. This was, after all, the women's sphere, the domestic interior, woman as mom, woman as nurturer. And she is someone who carefully pays attention to this and represents it quite lovely in her, in her work of art here. Now, with that being said, though, remember that even these women artists of the 19th century were not allowed. It was, it was considered a, a matter of social propriety that women were not supposed to really take to the streets and go out and observe politics and everyday social interactions on the streets the same way that their male Impressionist contemporaries were. It's a major subject, of course, of the male contemporary artists of this time period to play the role of the flaneur, a kind of amateur sociologist or glorified people watcher who was looking at their society and making commentary on all the big changes that were occurring during the 19th century. Women tended to draw upon what they knew not being allowed into this more social sphere. They drew subjects from the private sphere of the home, of women 
as nurturers and mothers. And this becomes the major subject of their art. So in even this way, women's art of the 19th century reflects some of the big beliefs that were ascribed to the different genders. Another example of this, Mary Cassatt's work, Young Girl Sewing. We see this over and again, women artists of the 19th century representing women in activities that were considered to be the women's sphere. Women weren't great artists per se, but they did do things that were in line with the crafts. And I bring this up here because we'll see an entire generation of feminist artists trying to revitalize and revalue these forms of art that were traditionally ascribed to crafts and not high art, such as sewing, needlework, creation of ceramics, and so forth. When we see women reading in the Impressionist works, this is another work by Mary Cassatt, Young Woman Reading, they're more often than not, we're not reading political tracts or newspapers. More often than not, they're reading things that are pulp novels, narratives. It's presumed that these are bringing them into the realm of a kind of fantasy uh, narrative, not something that is the realm of the man, politics, worldly issues, finances, and so forth. They are more often than not indulging in a kind of fantasy life in these pictures by representing them reading. Every once in a while, such as in this famous and oft uh, pointed to example by Mary Cassatt of her mother reading Le Figaro, we see a woman reading a newspaper. Now today we not, might not think much about this, but at the time this was almost a political manifesto showing a woman reading a newspaper during the 19th century in France when women uh, were arguing for some pretty basic rights. This falls in line with the first wave of feminism in a way. Feminism, by the way, is oftentimes historically divided into different waves. And that first wave, generally speaking, are women arguing for basic rights such as the right to own property, the right to uh, divorce their husband on their own terms, um, and most importantly, the right to vote. So showing a woman reading the paper could have caused all kinds of anxiety in a contemporary public that was certainly a little bit hesitant to let women enter into the sphere of politics that was formerly prescribed for men only. Some of the most kind of socially conscious artists of the late 19th, early 20th century are people like Kate Kollwitz, and you'll see in a moment Hannah Hock coming out of Germany. This is a work by Kate Kollwitz called The Outbreak. It's part of uh, a series of prints that she made called the Peasant Revolt series, uh, in which by creating a historical picture of the peasant revolts that occurred in the 16th century in Germany, Kate Kollwitz is actually exhorting the masses, the lower class masses, to rise up against the hierarchical system that was keeping them uh, as you know, second class citizens in Germany and to change that kind of social stratification that was occurring. In this case, notice that the woman who has her back to you with her hands up raised is a woman. This is a heroine or a leader as a woman, something that was not, again, in line with beliefs about what women were supposed to do in their own societies. Kate Kovitz also created works on weavers and such. The work that you see here on the screen in front of you, again, we're just looking at a few historical examples of women's art from, in this case, the early 20th century. This is a work by Hannah Hook called Da Dandy. She was a member of the Dadaist group, and she worked primarily in photo montages or collages of images taken out of magazines. What we see here is Hannah Hook seemingly uh, drawing our attention to the way that women and their looks were being, um, let's say, used by advertising culture to sell women new products, to sell them the idea of the new woman. Women uh, and their the way that they were esteemed, of course, is once again uh, placed squarely on the shoulders of how they look. Although in this work, Hannah Hawk seems to be calling attention to the way that that uh, attempt to define women as her looks is something that is socially constructed. Your reading by Norma Browd and Mary Garrard uh, starts with the question of, you know, why women artists in the United States before the 1960s did not consider themselves feminist, even when they attained a certain stature in the arts. 
And one of the most famous of all these early 20th century women artists is, of course, Georgia O'Keeffe. You're looking at her music, Pink and Blue, here on the screen. Georgia O'Keeffe uh, was very well trained by a famous uh, educator, Arthur Dow. She knew modernist theory inside and out. She produced, of course, these beautiful organic forms uh, of more or less abstract shapes that were meant to be visual uh, correlates for emotional states or thoughts that she couldn't quite express directly through language. She was oftentimes thought of just by the very fact of her birth uh, as a woman artist, which was something that she railed against because she felt like this ghettoized her. In general, we can think of these early, very frankly, successful women artists, but not as successful as their male contemporaries, as being defined by their sexual sexuality or by a better way to put this is by their gender, uh, whether they liked it or not. And they believe that this, again, marginalized them. After all, one doesn't say you're a great woman artist without thinking, yeah, but there's this entire other category out there where that term of artist is unmarked. When we say you're a great artist, the neutral term that is, of course, implied is that you're a male artist. And by saying you're a great woman artist, you are only attaining the status that your sex allows you to attain, not that of the male artist. Other, when George O'Keeffe famously did a series of works on urban uh, scenes, such as this one, uh, you know, it's called Night, she was told by her husband at the time, the famous photographer Alfred Stieglitz, that these things were not as strong as her more organic forms. Stieglitz firmly believed that George O'Keeffe was the greatest woman artist that had ever lived. But when she moved into a realm that, in this case, subject that represented urban cityscapes with hard architectonic forms, he believed those to be the purview of men. City, men. Nature, women. Hard forms, masculine. Soft, organic forms were feminine. And he did everything that he could to move her away from this form of representation, this type of subject matter, because as I said, he believed that as a woman, her essential nature did not allow her to create these types of forms in the same way that men could. She wasn't as attuned to the city as a male artist would be, and so she was dealing with a subject and dealing with form that was better done by men. Thus, of course, some of her most famous forms, such as this black iris, uh, are very organic forms. The subject are all drawn from nature, and most infamously, these works were interpreted as representations of female genitalia. These are all things that George O'Keeffe railed against. She wanted to be thought of as a great artist, not a great woman artist. And so, though she was a feminist in a way, Though, of course, her strength and some of her agitation for women's rights in her own personal life made her a feminist, she did not want the label feminist placed on her own art because it would ghettoize her. This is true as well as some of the key characters that were part of the moment of abstract expressionism, this key stylistic movement in the middle of the 20th century in the United States, uh, most iconically represented by the male figure in this picture, Jackson Pollock. His wife, who is literally taking him by the hand into the country in order to make his breakthrough style for those drip paintings, is Lee Krasner. Jackson Pollock uh, created works such as this, and it's worth us pausing for a moment and talking a bit about the context of mid-century in the United States and what was valued in art. Jackson Pollock's work here, it's called um, Lavender Mist, or Number One from 1950, is a work that was created out of his famous drip method. These works have, uh, and you're looking at here on the screen, that method in place. Jackson Pollock would lay unprimed canvases on the ground, 
put himself into a semi kind of trance state and allow his hand to move around the canvas, dripping all types of paints and materials onto the canvas to create these abstract forms. Now, all the abstract expressionists had high aspirations for the creation of their art, uh, but one of the major ways that this art was understood and valued was by a famous mid-century critic by the name of Clement Greenberg. Clement Greenberg is the figure you see here in this image, second from the left. Uh, next to him on the left is Lee Krasner. Next to Clement Greenberg on the right is Helen Frankenthaler, so two very important women artists of the abstract expressionist movement. Clement Greenberg believed that art should confine itself, each medium should confine itself to its strengths. He was a formalist art critic. He believed that what an art critic should do is pay attention to the way that artists create beautiful forms in their work of art. And he, and again, I'm just going over this briefly, this is a, a subject for a much larger lecture, valued the abstract expressionist artists, first Pollock and then later people like Mark Rothko, for pushing modern art towards greater and greater degrees of, uh, of purity reducing art to its essence. Painting should be about painting, not about social concerns. And so Pollock's work was the most advanced form of modernism during his time, and he valued it for that. Now, he also valued the work of Helen Frankenthaler, who, by the way, he was dating uh, at this time for this photo, and Lee Krasner, but not on the same terms as their male contemporaries. They never were given the same status as the male artists. Much of his terminology employed in his criticism is very gendered. He uses terms such as strength and aggressiveness and virility in respect to works by Pollock. Uh, but you never see that or very rarely see that same language, which again, historically is very gendered, um, used to speak about the work of these female artists. This is work by Lee Krasner, who literally said, and she's a very feminist artist later in her career, literally says over and over again that she had to put her art on hold so as to help Jackson Pollock, who she believed to be a great artist, achieve his greatness. In other words, she was a bit of the woman behind the man while Pollock was alive and only kind of struck out on her own uh, and, and dealt with feminist themes after Pollock died. And then even at that moment, was hesitant to ever have her work ascribed to feminist concerns. Same thing with people like Joan Mitchell, another abstract expressionist artist who was very successful, but not as successful as her male contemporaries, or Helen Frankenthaler, who even in this work uh, created a style, these kinds of stained canvases that was then picked up by later artists but was never valued at the same level as the male contemporaries. What Norma Browd and Nancy Garrard want to point out to you is that at a certain moment, a lot of women began to understand that the playing field was never level in the first place when it came to all forms of female activities, but particularly in the arts. Women were always going to be the second sex when it came to the creation of arts until that playing field was leveled. This was, after all, the main aspiration of the second wave of feminism, which began during the civil rights movement in the 1950s, but really gained a lot of attention in the middle of the 1960s through the 1970s. In the second wave of feminism, women were striving to create equality, not just voting rights, but equality in all forms of activity and in all ways that people were valued. Leading into the feminist moment, Many art historians point out that there are certain works of art that are what one might call proto-feminists, before feminist proper really gets going, or before artists very clearly start thinking of their art as, uh, as an instrument for social change. And one of those famous moments is a work by the artist Yoko Ono, uh, before she met John Lennon, by the way. She was a member of the Fluxus movement. And what you're looking at here on the screen is a famous work called The Cut Piece. In this work, Yoko Ono sat on stage passively, kind of the epitome of the female condition, to remain passive, and invited 
anyone who is in the audience to come up and cut an article of her clothing off and take it with them if they so wanted. Her job was to remain passive in this situation. This is an example of what we oftentimes call participation performance, where the audience breaks the fourth wall, this kind of imaginary barrier that's usually set up between an audience and the act that's going on on the stage in order to participate in some way. The reason in general that artists do this is that they want the audience to perform the meaning of the work of art. Or in other words, in this situation, imagine yourself in the audience being invited to come up and cut an article of clothing off Yoko Ono. Everything that goes through your mind, all the unanticipated events that might occur become the meaning of the work. The artist is only partially in control. They're like a catalyst for an activity that might gain some kind of moment of reflection uh, about the events as they unfold. I have provided a link uh, on the page with uh, these lectures so that you can go watch at least part of one of these performances of Yoko Ono's cut piece, and I hope that you'll do this. Uh, it is really telling. She sits up on stage passively, members come up to cut off parts of her clothing, and then they, of course, have to think about what they've just done in relation to the audience that surveils them, sees them doing this act. If you're like me, sitting in the audience, the meaning of this work starts when you start thinking, am I even going to go do this? If I go, what piece of clothing am I going to cut off? And why did I decide that piece of clothing to cut off? As you see in the performance, there's at least one male audience member who gets very aggressive, cuts a lot of her clothing off, and her passivity kind of flees from her, and she starts looking very anxious. The audience responds to that audience member by uh, cat calls and telling him to get off the stage and using terms like stop being such a cheese ball and so forth. He then has to think about what this all means to them. Now, how could this be considered a proto-feminist work of art? And the answer to that is that as many interpreters have understood this work, Yoko Ono plays the role of the fast, passive female figure while she authorizes the, the audience to come do something to her. They then interpret this work as Yoko Ono setting up a situation in which people can see the ways that various forms of aggression or violence are authorized by society towards women. I used to like to think of this uh, or extend this to thinking about how various contexts in which women might find themselves authorize particular forms of behavior towards them. Walking up and down University Ave, for instance, I note over and again what I find to be incredibly uh, aggressive attitudes by young men towards the women they see, asking young women to smile at them, uh, flirting with them, at least on their own terms, catcalling at them, giving them all kinds of attention that these women have not solicited. Those types of attitudes and actions towards women are authorized in some way by the society around them, or in this case, by the context around them. And Yoko Ono, it seems, was setting up a situation in which people could think about all the ways that society authorizes particular attitudes and behaviors towards women. Another proto-feminist moment, uh, again, another member of the Fluxus group in the middle of the century, is this work called Vagina Painting by Shigeka Kobota. Um, again, this is in some way a reference to Jackson Pollock's famous paintings. What Shigeka Kobota did is in a performance space, she rolled out butcher paper on the floor, set up a bucket full of paints over on the side and somehow affixed a paintbrush to her crotch. Then she went out and dipped that paintbrush in the paints, stepped out on the butcher paper and began painting uh, with this extension of her vagina. Now, if you're thinking, what the hell does this have to do with feminism? It's a kind of critique of notions of creativity. After all, Jackson Pollock was a drip painter. Think of the irony or the humor that is implied in this action. But even more kind of cuttingly, what Shigeka Kobota was pointing towards was a major construction about how creativity occurred in the arts that was premised upon a kind of gendered idea. 
Over to the right now, you see a work by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, an early 20th century German expressionist artist. It's called The Artist and His Model, and you see the artist's self-portrait in the foreground uh, and in the background, his model. Now, Kirchner oftentimes pointed out, and many artists of the modern period pointed this out, that they took a kind of erotic charge from their interactions with their female models, and then they re-channeled that erotic charge into the creation of their art. This is a kind of standard discourse about inspiration or the muse of the male artist, almost always a beautiful younger woman. If you look at that painting closely, you'll notice that Kirshner is holding the paintbrush down by his groin area. And this is in reference to a famous metaphor that the male artist painted with their loins or what is oftentimes known as the penis's paintbrush metaphor. Yes, there literally was this metaphor in place. The male virile artist re-channeled his erotic energy, his, let's say, sexual erotic energy towards women into the creation of art. Now stop and think about this. What is the correlative for female creative energy? Would it have been socially appropriate for a female artist to show a hot, you know, shirtless young man in the background of their painting and to say that they were painting from their loins? Probably not. And that's the type of revelation that Chigeko Kubota's work, at least in part, is meaning to draw our attention to, this kind of dichotomous relation an asymmetrical relation between the muse or inspiration, sexual sexuality, uh, and the creation of great works of art. The first major artist of this lecture is the artist Carolee Schneeman. I'm going to pause here uh, and give myself a, a moment, and then we will come back with part two of this lecture.